Hey, it's Alex from Board Game Co. and welcome to another episode of Play This Not That. In Play This Not That, we take two board games with some degree of similarity, some degree of overlap, some degree as to why you might pick one over the other, and then shockingly enough, I compare them. I give you my opinion, my quick overview of the two games, and I tell you which one I think is a better game, which one I think is the preferred game, the one you should have in your collection. It does not mean that the loser is a bad game, not by any means. Sometimes I get rid of the other one. Many times I keep both. Sometimes it's just a question of, I like to go into things. I like to explore the pros and cons. Honestly, I just like talking about board games. If you subscribe to this channel for any reason, if you're new here, if you're a regular, I just like talking about board games. That's all I'm trying to do. And in this case, in this episode, we are comparing code names to monikers. Monikers and code names are two party games, and this one's suggested by Billy Indiana, if I recall correctly. Suggested this in the comments down below, doing a play this, not that. And so let's go into them. Let's cover one of them at a time, starting with code names. Now, the the target for this particular video, the discussion I'm trying to have, is specifically about party games that are the best possible gateway party games you can possibly have, meaning Ultimately, we all like board games, or at least if you're here, you probably like board games. Alternatively, you just went to someone's house who introduced you to code names or monikers. You went to YouTube, Googled this, and found this channel. Hi, it's nice to have you here. But party games are a fascinating conversation, and some gamers look at them with a look at look on at them with a degree of dismissiveness of, well, they're not that great, they're not that exciting. But they can be. They can be that exciting depending on which ones you pick, and they can be great ways to introduce people to board games. At the end of the day, we're just trying to play more games, and sometimes that means introduce, introducing people to the hobby that you and I already love, that you and I already see the potential and the promise, the reasons we keep playing these games. And so I find that very often you, you're trying to convince someone, effectively convince them, hey, I'm an adult, take a look around my room, look at these shelves full of board games, and no, I'm not strange. No, I'm not some, you know, you know I, don't, I mean, I don't even know what I want to compare it to, but there's a degree of tolerance you want to introduce people to. And sometimes all you really need to do to get that message across is show them something you love. Introduce them to something that you love in a way that they will love it too. Now, I'm very wary of pushing my hobby on people. Very wary of it. Hey, do you, we all have that one friend who likes hiking, that one friend who, no matter how many times you try to tell them not to, always wants to go on a hike with you. They always want to introduce their hobby to you and sometimes drag it, drag the worst out of it. And I, I don't want my board games, my hobby, to be like that, not in the slightest. I want, I want to share it with people, but I want to share the love of board games, and, and that means picking the right board game for the right person, and that's very often a challenge. But two games that have without fail, completely without fail, impressed people when I've introduced them to, whether it's someone who completely, you know, non-gamer, no, no whatever, versus someone who, on the heavier end who I actually think might be a great fit for Gloomhaven, but regardless of what, what where they are in the spectrum, the two games that I have had I want to say 100% success rate with, I'd have to think through if there are any exceptions, but I want to say 100% success rate are code names and monikers. Code names and monikers are both party games. They are both, one's divine by Vladis Shvatil and one is a reprint of a, of a open, I can't remember the word, but a, an existing game that's an open, uh, open domain, I think, something domain, but public domain, public domain game monikers. And they are both incredibly fun, incredibly fun in very different ways. In code names, what you effectively do is you lay out five cards, you lay out five by five, and each card has words in it from force, tracks, bike, rabbit, scale. And then from there you have these code cards, and these code cards will effectively tell people what they, what cards they want to give. So for example, if I pull out one of these code cards, it'll have a grid showing you which cards belong to which people. And we take that code card and we set it up in the handy dandy little stand over here, and you put it in front of the code, code givers so that they can see the, the, the cards and the codes that they need to get their teammates to guess. And from there you have to give a clue. And the clue you want to give, let's say I'm looking at this board over here and I'm trying to connect two words. So for example, I see the word unicorn here and the word dragon here, and they're both my cards. I'm the blue team right now. And so I have to connect those two words. So I look carefully around the board and I pause and I analyze and I say, mythical two hoping that the person will connect dragon and unicorn, the only two cards on this board, hoping that they will get 
from my clue. Mythical is the clue. Two is the number of words I'm trying them to get them to guess. But sadly, unfortunately, I made a mistake and the word Atlantis is also there. These are actual, I don't know how much you can see in the video, but these are actual words. Atlantis is also there. And now the problem is the, my teammates looking at me and saying, well, I see unicorn, Atlantis, and dragon, but which two did you mean? Now, realistically, as the clue giver, that means I screwed up. That's what it really means. But the goal here is to introduce a clue that you combine certain words. You, you find the tie-in between different words with some elegant clue that connects them. And two is fun, but what if you can get three, four? What if you can say, you know, I don't know, blue, four? And you, the person looks around the board and they see, well, you know, cold is there. Maybe cold has to do with blue, cold, water. I don't know. It seems too hard. Roses are red. The word's rose, but roses are red, not blue. Then maybe the other three were trying to be blue and you had to somehow connect them. What about eagles? Eagles fly in the sky. Is that blue? What did that person think? What was going through their mind? And it's fascinating to build those mental connections, to build those, those connections between different words in every single card. And every time you play, you pull a different clue card. Next time you play, you pull another one of these cards. And the whole game has changed. The whole dynamic of what you're trying to do, that entire board, even without changing it, it's now a completely different configuration. Because now, those uni that unicorn and dragon are no longer connected. You can't connect them at all. In fact, unicorn is the other team's card. Dragon is your card. And Atlantis is the death card. The death card is the card that if anyone ever guesses, you completely lose. The game is fascinating and fun, and it's all about building these, these connections between wards, building these lines that you, you analyze the cards in front of you, come up with a clue, think it through, look at all the cards. I still to this day remember the first time I played, one of the, one of the first times I played, when I gave the clue Fruit 2, or sorry, sorry, my wife gave the clue Fruit 2, and I looked at the board and I analyzed the cards and I said, fly. And then she said, apple and banana, you freaking idiot. I looked past, I, I forgot to look at all the cards and I just went with any association and fruit fly. Fruit fly is a fair association, but apple and banana were on the board and I ma made a mistake. Or alternatively, the other time, my wife was trying to connect the clue steak and no, no, it was, it was cow and Joan of Arc. She was trying to connect cow with Joan of Arc. And so she said, steak two. And I got it because cow is in steak and Joan of Arc was burned at the steak. This game is all about finding those connections, finding those lines where you connect a, a myriad of clues together in one perfect harmonious clue. And very often you, your teammates will guess wrong, very often they'll guess right, very often they'll get two or three right before they get one wrong, but every once in a while you'll give a four word clue, clue a five word clue, someone will get it and you will cheer in the mental synergies that are going on in this game. This game is strategic. It is fun, it is hard, it is, it is a blast to play as a party, as a group. It is an amazing game that has, without fail, brought people into this hobby. And I don't mean that they went from playing code names to asking to play, I don't know, Food Chain Magnet or whatever, but rather they saw, for a brief moment, they saw the spark of what I see in board games. For a brief moment, they understood why I have shelves full of board games. For a brief moment, they, they captured that magic, that magic that we, we hold in our hearts of Monopoly is a good game. I had fun playing Monopoly, but in reality as adults we don't choose to play Monopoly, or most of us don't. We understand why board games exist. We understand that board games are there to unite us, to bring us together, and we have fond memories of those times, of those in instances. But some of us were lucky enough, fortunate enough, you and I were fortunate enough to rediscover board games as an adult, or perhaps never to have left it at all. Others are not as lucky. Others are not as fortunate. And I don't mean that anyone has to like board games, not in the slightest. If someone doesn't like board games, that's fine. But all too often, it's not that they don't like board games, but rather they haven't been introduced to the right board games. So often in life, we, we age people along with their content. They read a book that's correct for the age, and then they, they turn a little older, and they're 8, and suddenly we introduce them to a new book. And then they turn 11, 10, 12, and we introduce them to new books, young adult, adult literature. We escalate the content along with the person. Movies too. There's, there's an age bracket to the type of media we deliver to people. But then board games it doesn't work that way. With board games, we start them off with, with Candyland, we escalate to Monopoly, and then we just throw everyone off a bridge and we don't introduce people to, to a slow escalation of the correct content that is age appropriate. 
Is it any wonder that not enough people like board games? And, and don't get me wrong, I'm thankful that we live in a day and age where more and more people are rediscovering that, more and more people are being reconnected. And code names is a big part of that reconnection. Games like code names, any other gateway game, Splendor, whatever it is, but today's subject is code names. Code names is a great game. If it's, if it's not clear how I feel about code names, well, I can't, don't have to tell you there. From there we have monikers. Monikers is the other one in this in this series. Monikers is another game that I have a 100% success rate of people seeing their love of gaming. And the way Monikers works is you have a bunch of people who choose a bunch of cards, they put them out, combine them to a common pool, and they go through the cards. They look at them, they pick them, and suddenly you have this common pool. Let's grab a bunch of cards over here. And then you go, you create teams of people, teams of players. So you have two teams in the game, and they take turns going through it. And you start with one person, and you say, well, uh, the title character Samuel Beckett's absurdist play who Vladimir and Estragon wait for, Godot, I have no clue who that is. Uh, our Marxist leader in the Cuban Revolution, Che, che Guevara. Uh, um, the, the, what's it called? These are people who you have permission to kick from South Park. South Park said to, that you should be able to, a ginger, a ginger. And you go through these games coming out with the clues one at a time, and that's just round one. And round one is fun, don't get me wrong. But the game only takes us to the next escalation, where you go to the next level, and suddenly you're going through the same cards. Let me just read a few of these off so we have them. We have Godot, Grandma Nazi, Chris Farley, Judas Iscariot, Christopher Walken, a hoarder, shirtless Vladimir Putin, Baby Jesus, and the astronaut who drove across the country wearing space diapers to kidnap her boyfriend. Wow. That is an interesting card right there. And these cards are interesting, make no mistake. And suddenly you get to round two and everyone's been collecting points and having fun trying to get people to read the card. But in round two, you can't say whatever you want. You can't read from the, well, you could read from the card, but in round two, you only have one word. So let's play along together. So, I'm gonna skip that one. Um, kick, South Park, that's right, good job. Uh, Marxist, Che Guevara, good job, good job. Uh, absurdist, Godot, superhero, She-Hulk. I don't even know, I'm gonna skip this one. Um, 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 Hitler, Grandma Nazi, uh, Comedian, Chris Farley. You can keep going, you get, you get an idea over here, and then, and then from there you take those same cards, those cards that you're already starting to build this ins these inside jokes around, these, this humor that everyone at the table is starting to laugh as they come up with these absurd, absurdist, remember that, that card over there? They come up with these absurd clues to, to get everyone involved in the game, these little inside jokes that are developing even as you play. And then in round three it's just charades, and I don't know how this is going to play out, let's find out. Um, Che Guevara, good job. See, I'm trying to use my, my, my yarmulke as a thing. Um, a ginger, good job. Okay. Uh, Chris Farley, you see, overweight comedian, that's what I was doing. I'm gonna skip that one, skip that one. Um, um, Grama Nazi, good job. And you see, you keep going through these. You, I don't know if how bad it is that I'm impersonating Hitler and Nazis on a video here, but I didn't pick that card. These are all randomly drawn. But that is what, what Monikers is. Monikers is a hilarious, episodic version of charades where each round gets funnier and funnier as the jokes get more and more interesting, more and more inside. And by the time you're done to the end of the round, you're sitting there just, you've all created this these inside jokes that no one else would ever have any context of understanding. But through the playing of the game, through the playing, through each round of the game, as one person said one thing wrong, as one person started to use this clue for that card, as one person completely misunderstood what you said and said something about an airplane, and now an airplane is the next clue for the next round. These inside jokes develop as you play monikers and people who couldn't understand for the life of them why I like to have giant miniatures on my shelf why I play board games with with elves and wizards and dice and do whatever and they are looking at me like what is wrong with you and why haven't you grown up yet but they are starting to see that magic. They are starting to be pulled into a world of imagination a world of silliness a world of ridiculousness in terms of just by being involved in this game. And I know that was a lot to take in. A bit of monikers, a bit of code names, no real precise rules of both, but hopefully a general feeling of what these two entail. And for today's Play This Not That, there is no clear winner. It depends on how you define the terms. It depends on how you define what constitutes a win in these two games. If a win is bringing people into the hobby, monikers takes the cake slightly. Marginally, marginally, because you see, code names for all the amazing content it delivers, for all the amazing experiences it has, ultimately I find code names is a little bit lacking because it's a little bit too analytical. You can have clue givers sitting there 
analyzing the board in front of them, trying to figure out a way to combine the words bill, band, and bomb. And, and you're not actually, by the way, good note here, you're not actually allowed to use things that are letters. You can't say like B, hoping to admit, that gets them to understand that they're all Bs, which was just an interesting tidbit there. But Codenames ends up being a drop to analytical. Where people sit there and puzzle through bomb, bill, band, uh, a bomb and a band, uh, a bill. Uh, they, they get stuck in these combinations and it takes a little bit of the hilariousness outside of the game. And so in terms of a pure, better experience to introduce people to something that is hilarious and, and appealing and something that they probably haven't heard of until they sat down at your table, Monikers is a slightly better game. But if we're evaluating this on which is the better game, then I think Codenames would win that upside down. I think Codenames is the better game. Codenames is a more elegant system. For the same reason I think it is slightly, marginally inferior as a gateway game, I think it is also that same reason that makes it a better mechanical game. Monikers relies more on the hilariousness and the fun, which is not a problem, don't get me wrong at all, there's nothing wrong with that. But when I look, when I'm trying to admire the two systems and see which one is something that I want to play a bit more, which one's more of a challenge for me, because I like a challenge. I like decisions in games. I like the process of, of being faced with something that I need to overcome, whether it's how to navigate that elf and wizard around the board to defeat the dragon, versus whether it's how to combine two cards and code names. I like a challenge, and I find code names is slightly more analytical and slightly more decision based, and I think it is a better game. But if you are trying to bring people into the hobby, I think Monikers is slightly better. That being said, they're both great, and I would give an additional piece of advice, which is, I would say Codenames is better if you have a group of four or, or even six players. It does work with five, but I find Teams is better. Versus Monikers is significantly better as soon as you hit a play count of eight. So if you're at eight or 10 or any version thereof, any higher amount, Monikers works better in large groups. Codenames works better with four. When it comes to six, that's where they kind of cross over very nicely. So that is basically it. That's my opinion. My play this, not that really comes down to depends on how you're judging them. And no, these two games are not going anywhere. I love monikers. I have boxes full of expansion content on the shelf. I love code names. In fact, I recommend addition to in addition to code names, there's code names pictures, which is another great game. Not as good as regular code names. I think I prefer regular code names. The pictures are a bit more abstract. I, I prefer Dixit if I'm doing something like that. But what I do particularly love is code names duet. Not nearly as much as a gateway game. Not nearly as as much in that context. For a gateway game, pure codenames is a better experience. But if you want to introduce people, if you want to introduce a couple to a game, if you want to buy a couple that you know the best possible game, we're all in lockdown over here, we're all in quarantine, if you want one of the best possible gameplay experiences, one of the best possible gifts you can give any couple that you know, or really group of friends for that matter at all, I think Codenames Duet is an incredible experience. They do not have to be gamers. In fact, I would argue they shouldn't be. If there are gamers, they might, there might be better choices that you can give them and hopefully they already have this. But if you want to introduce someone, if you want to gift them this world of magic that you and I inhabit, if you want to gift them this universe, this, this ability to look at, at things on the shelf and see experiences, not to see toys. I mean, granted, it's all a toy when, you come, when it comes down to it. But you and I have these, these, this, this access to these worlds that other people don't. When other people sit there and, you know, look and talk about sports, when other people sit there and go back to the, the desk and watch a movie or uh, I don't know what other people want to do for their time. And I don't mean to disrespect anyone else's hobby. But I do think board games are the best possible hobby to be involved in. I think they are, I think they train the mind, they develop our own mind, they build relationships, they, they, they have the furthest thing from that zoning out effect that a screen will have. They are active activities instead of passive activities. They are a gift to be given. Both code names and monikers are incredible experiences and you can't go wrong with either. I highly recommend both of them. I highly recommend code names duet. I hope in some way my enthusiasm for these games came through in this video. I am very passionate about both these games. They are excellent, excellent games that I think everyone should play. I hope you enjoy this episode of Play This Not That. This is an opportunity to do this for the first time on my new coffee game table, which I don't know the order of the videos, but you may or may not have seen that video already. In any case, I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. If you want more content, more passion, more videos, more Kickstarter coverage, play this, not that, and all the other stuff I do, 
go ahead and click subscribe in the comments down below. It's been a pleasure having you here. I hope you enjoyed, and until next time, have a good one.